Like they're working it started. Thanks for um, surviving the polar vortex and making that today. It's a little bit warmer. Uh, the snow should be melting this weekend. Welcome, uh, especially if this is your first time at our data science user group. Welcome to 2019. Um, this user group exists to foster collaboration and learning around data science in the local Champaign Urbana community. So um, we've had the past couple years of doing this, we've had a lot of great speakers um, from the university, from different uh, companies and other institutions around town, and uh, we've also been trying to do some collaboration around data science and trying to solve some local problems, and I'll give some updates about that. Um, so I'm excited you're here. We've got an excited lineup today. I'm going to give some updates about some things happening locally and some other opportunities uh, around data science in the community, and then we've got uh, Professor Larry uh, Flake and here who's going to give a great presentation about storytelling with data. Uh, so a couple things going on in the community. Um, there's a hackathon which is actually tomorrow. Um, it's a 24-hour hackathon. There's actually over $5,000 in prizes. So there's three different uh, challenges around ag tech. So if this is your interest or you want to learn in this area, you can certainly um, uh, jump into that. And so I sent some information out about that earlier in the week. Um, and a lot of this information is available on the website online. Uh, so feel free to jump into that. And then also coming up next week, there is a software carpentry workshop. Um, where they're focusing on uh, R and SQL as the main programming languages. So there is a $40 registration fee. It's a two-day workshop. And this is really a great introduction if you're trying to really build your data science skill set. Um, knowing R and SQL are, are great starting points. So I encourage you, if you have the, the time and energy, uh, to take advantage of this great workshop on campus. So I want to talk for a couple minutes about some community data science updates. This is something we started as part of this user group last summer uh, of trying to be more involved in doing data science for good in the local Champaign and Urbana community. And uh, it started actually with the Pig Hack Festival in September, where a few of us got together and tried to plan some specific projects and hack ideas for that event. It was uh, fairly successful. A bunch of the Pig Hack submissions were around those data science projects. And coming out of that, we really wanted to try to um, attract some uh, local nonprofits and, and civic organizations to uh, really bring their use cases to this data science user group and, and try to uh, leverage volunteer skill sets to solve those problems. So we've been talking to different organizations. There's a couple updates uh, of organizations that have kind of stepped up and said they had problems they wanted to get solved and, and were uh, trying to match them with people here. So one thing is with the, the local United Way chapters. They, uh, they do a lot of stuff in the community. They help fund different nonprofits in the area to solve um, different problems and, and meet different needs. And they also gather a lot of data and they publish a community report every couple years. And so one thing they were looking for is really just someone who could go deep with them and, and partner with them uh, to do data research and analytics that can help uh, really surface some of the insights around what's happening uh, in this area. So they uh, put an ask out to, to have this uh, volunteer intern opportunity and they had a, a nice job description and, and different things about what that role would be uh, and, and their hope would be actually I think starting in February going through about May kind of a normal uh, semester long internship opportunity to really generate a lot of uh, insightful data and, and things that they could use for their report which they're planning to publish later this year. So we got the word out and what happened is we had uh, about 15 volunteers that were connected with the user group or heard about it through the user group that were interested. Nine of them formally applied. And so that was whittled down to two people who were identified. They, they originally just wanted one, but they, they had two great applicants, so they're gonna go with two people who they're connecting to start doing this work. And we're hoping to have updates in the next couple months, and definitely by May, of, of really what these volunteers are able to do and really how they can serve in you know, a way to make an impact. So that's an exciting uh, thing that's happening. Uh, and now I want to talk about a new opportunity. This is uh, a new data challenge we're announcing today. Um, so you are the first people to hear about this. This opportunity to really serve a, an organization that's trying to help people in need. The Salvation Army, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that organization, they have chapters around the country, and the Salvation Army really exists to help people in need. Right? They, they serve a lot of low-income people uh, with some basic human needs, also some training um, with, with helping with uh, different skills that they can uh, build up for people. And, and one thing that is important to them is just having funding for their work to, to give them the, the ability to take care of people and have staff that, that can actually be available to support people and go around town uh, to serve those people in need. And, and during the holiday season, if you, if you go around town, you've probably seen this. In November and December, there's bell ringers located in different uh, 
usually storefronts where they're trying to collect money. Uh, and, and so that's a very important part of how they can fund their operations to serve the community. Um, but but there's, uh, there's something interesting about that. So the, the locations that they've chosen have, haven't necessarily been data driven. They've been locations that just were available because you know historically those businesses said, you know, yeah, we'll let you be there. And that's just a place where volunteers live nearby. And so they said, okay, we're just gonna have that be the place where we have the bell ringer set up. So what we're thinking about is, is how can we use data to think about you know, what's really going on with, with how people are donating to the Salvation Army and even what locations could be better than what's being used today. And so that's really what this, this challenge is about, is, is two different kind of aims of this challenge. And I'll show you, show you what the data looks like as well. Um, so the first thing is, is a diagnostic problem. It's determine the key factors for Salvation Army donations. And if you think about what we have data around is we have, for every day between mid-November and before Christmas Eve, we have the dollar amount by location, that means a, a business address and city and zip code of how much was donated, and it's usually an eight hour shift during uh, the normal working hours or how much was donated. So the, the challenge here is saying, okay, why on certain days in certain locations was there more donations than other places? Um, and, and see what, what are the main factors that could be causing that or at least correlated to the rise in, in, in giving for Salvation Army. And this can help them think about who are, the, who are the types of people that are giving money to Salvation Army? What are the factors? I, I, I put down here weather data. I think weather could be a big factor, right? If, if the weather's horrible outside, people aren't going to be going to the stores, and even so, they're going to be rushing inside. They're not going to be standing outside trying to donate money. Just so they're aware, like, what are some big factors that are going to impact giving to Salvation Army? That's the diagnostic aspect. The predictive aspect is to take it another level and say, okay, given the current locations we have and understanding what are the factors that lead to donations, what are some other locations that could be good opportunities for the Salvation Army to uh, place volunteers? Um, like I said, volunteers today are kind of, and staff are just matched to the location they already know about, either historically they've been connected with, but they could be proactive and say, hey, there's some stores that we could contact that maybe they're in areas that we're not reaching today where people might want to give money, but they don't have the opportunity um, because there's no bell ringer nearby that they could then um, be strategic about, about putting people. So this could use, there's a lot of interesting data sets that could be combined with this, um, things around the census data, home price data, there's a lot of creativity with this data challenge because the actual data set is about a thousand, it's less than a thousand data points. It's, it's really the, I think there's 35 different locations in the, the greater Champaign and Urbana area and then there's you know, 30 days or 35 days of donations. So the actual data, the donation data is not very large. So the, the problem here is, is how can we bring in other data sets to give more insights into what Salvation Army is doing and give them feedback say here, here's what's working, here's what's not working and here's what you could do differently. Uh, one thing about a, a, a place like Salvation Army, and probably a lot of nonprofits, you know, civic, civic organizations, I think they would agree with this, is that they don't have the resources, uh, you know, they, they don't have the ability or funding to hire a full time data scientist. That's just not possible. And so they can think about the fact that it would be great to dive into this data, it would be great to be more data driven and making decisions and being strategic, but they just don't have the capacity. That their funding is going towards their, their hands on day to day efforts in, in, in doing the mission of that, uh, the nonprofit or the charity board. And so that's where I, I think this opportunity is really interesting as volunteers, as this data science user group, is that we can actually meet a need in the community and help them out by providing them with some of this analytics work, some of this um, machine learning, data science work, to actually try to give them more insights into how they could be a better organization. And, and, and they want this. They're interested and open to this information. Um, and even if that motivation isn't good enough, I think just doing hands-on data work and showing a you know project that you publicize on your own GitHub or somewhere else, that's good for the resume. If you, if you read about um, getting hired as a data scientist, a lot of people now are looking for data science portfolios that individuals have showcased what they can do publicly. In a GitHub repository, they showcase, hey, here's a data set I took, a public data set, and here's what I was able to produce. And so that's the other motivation. So if, if not, do it for the community, do it for yourself. It'll help you in your career in building your portfolio. But I, but I am really hopeful that people um, will take advantage of this opportunity and, and do something to really help out the Salvation Army. So if you're interested, next steps. So we have a GitHub repository that has more details um, about this data challenge and actually has that data set I talked about. But you can go there, it's, it's a public repository, you can access it and, and download the data and start 
you know, trying to, to explore the data and think about how you would solve this problem. Uh, our, our goal is to actually have those of you who go off and tackle this problem and have results to, to come back uh, in March or April, we'll see how long it takes people to do something impactful, and actually present these results. And, and have, uh, you know, we're connected with the, uh, the lead person there at the Salvation Army. He's the one who gave us the data. He's the one who's interested in this use case. Have him sit and observe the results and, and have him tell you about the impact this can make. Uh, so right now, we're not sure, in terms of collaboration, we're not sure if there's going to be like two of you interested or like 30 of you interested. So we have different ideas about how we could collaborate. We have the, the meetup message board, which could be used. We're thinking of other options. Of, of really getting people in a, in a forum environment to discuss what ideas they have, even to, to work together. Um, so right now, if you're interested in working on this, you can just contact me um, through Meetup and just say, hey, I'm interested in working on this. I'd love to you know, collaborate with others. or love you know, more information about it. And just start there. You can just say you're interested, and we're going to figure out a way to get those people together, um, possibly even meeting together uh, throughout the month to, to collaborate intentionally to solve this problem. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can... Um, talk to me afterwards, but that's really um, that's really the, the gist of this challenge, is really trying to empower people to use the skill sets they either have or are trying to grow in to help meet needs in the local community. And, and, and we're also hoping this is the start, that, that things like this Salvation Army data challenge is the start of something we can do in a much bigger way in the community. We've been talking to other um, nonprofits and civil organizations, and we're trying to show them that if you have a problem and you have data with it, we can get people to solve it for you. For those organizations that don't have the resources themselves, we want to help them by stepping in to solve those problems. So any burning questions about this? That's something I missed about this data challenge. Or about this community data science effort that we're doing. Okay, well if you do have questions, you can talk to me afterwards. But I'm done talking now, and I'd like to turn it over. I'm really excited um, for Wade here. He's, he's uh, um, been doing a lot of education around data science, and specifically data visualization. So he's going to uh, teach us a lot of things and inspire us about how to use visualizations around data. So will you please welcome uh, Wade with me. Thanks for inviting me. This is a real privilege to be here, and it's awesome to see so many people passionate about data science and data visualization. And I'm here because I think I feel the same way as you about a lot of this stuff, that data science is awesome. But data science often gets involved in all of this calculus and math very quickly, and sometimes I feel like even this stuff kind of escapes me. And at the end of the day, what I've come to realize more and more is even as I've gone through these deep mathematical dives, is that data science is often really only as interesting as the story it tells. So today, I'm going to try and give a little bit of a deep dive in telling that story with data visualization and how we can actually use the data that we have and the data that we're able to collect at the end of our analysis process to actually do things with data, to make the data science that we're doing shareable and really exciting to a lot of people. So, um, there's, this talk's gonna just sort of go over four different spots. We won't spend too much time on any one of them, but I wanna make sure that there's something for every one of you. And I'll start with a little bit of an introduction on data visualization. Because all of us are extremely intelligent, we all know a lot of information, but there's a lot of technical bits to data science that I want to make sure that we um, talk about and we have a common vocabulary. So we'll just do a really deep dive. Some of you will already know all of it. This will be um, new stuff for some of you, which is awesome. So we'll get a common vocabulary, and then we'll look at a data set that's uniquely Illinois. Like the Salvation Army data set that we just heard about, that's a fantastic data set. So we're gonna look at a data set about that size and do a visualization with that data set. Um, and then we're gonna create our very own visualization. There's a visualization that's never been seen outside of this room that we're gonna create together and see how we can take that data set and do something that, that's somewhat interesting. It really tells a story. And we'll talk about the story as we go along. And then I'll give a little bit of an update of some of the data science education we're doing at the University of Illinois and making sure that everyone has data science education when they, become, when they come out of the university. 
So I want this talk to not just be me telling you things and kind of sharing my work, but we're going to, after that, this introduction, we're going to make it so that you're going to kind of get engaged and we'll have some sharing and some fun puzzles for us to solve as we go through it. So that's going to come up in a few minutes. And because I really want this to not just be, you're not watching on YouTube, we're here in this room together. So we should utilize that fact, and I hope you'll get excited about that. So just to kind of start us off, there's going to be a, a five minutes of just really broad overview. I usually spend like two weeks of this in my class on data visualization, but we'll cover it in just five minutes. And I call the most important thing to know about data visualization is what I would sometimes refer to as the quadrant of success, or the data visual, visualization quadrant. And I try and divide up everything into twos, because we're all a little bit of a computer scientist as a data scientist, so we know zeros and ones. So I think we can all have groups of two. And the quadrant really has an upper segment and a lower segment. And the upper part of the quadrant is going to be all about how we classify our data. So every time we do any data analysis, we're going to have to classify our data. And in doing that, there's going to be two different categories we can classify all data as. The first is we can classify data as quantitative data. And quantitative data is anything with an exact value. And just in keeping with the powers of two, there's going to be two types of quant data. The first type is going to be continuous. So this is like your income. You can, it has a decimal, it kind of goes up and hopefully only up. And there's a GPA, which that goes up and down, depending on how you're doing a course. Students always know their GPA, they know it's a continuous spectrum. So there, and the other type of quant data is discrete data. So these have a fixed value. So these are things that are countable. The number of people in this room is a fixed data. The days since the first, the January 1st is a countable thing. So this is discrete data. So one side of data is quant, the other side of data is categorical data. So these are things that have been bucketed. So if anything we assign categories to or buckets to, we have either nominals, so this is things that have specific categories that don't have a natural ordering. So for example, gender. There's categories of gender, there's no ordering between those categories. And the, the state that you're born in, also, lots of different categories. Um, no states other than Illinois, better than others. Um, and then there's order data. So order data is anything that has a natural order of categories. So this is like your age range bra bracket. The difficulty level of a puzzle or something might be order, like beginning, intermediate, hard. Anything where there's a natural one progresses to another. So these are, anytime we see data, I think we can fit the data into one of these four categories. And these four categories will help inform us about how we can tell a story with that data. And what's the best representation of that in a visualization. And with that, we're going to look at the lower half of the project. And this is the visual representation of the data. And there's two ways to do that. So the one way is we'll talk about doing things with a planar encoding with visualization. So x, y position of data. So where it is on the screen, where the axes are, where it's physically located, that's going to be planar location. It works great with quant data. And um, works well with high dimensional categorical data. And if you have other categorical data, especially low dimensional categorical data, then retinal encoding is the way to go. So this is sort of how your eyes perceive it. And there's six major categories. So this is like the quadrant of success that I tell my students. That we need to identify what the type of data is, and then from that we can look down and see what the best type of encoding is. And just by using this kind of trick and using the quadrant, we're going to be able to tell a compelling story about data visualization without having to really think too much about it, which is really what we want to do. So I want to share the six types of retinal encoding, and then we'll really get into engaging with each other. So there are six different categories of data, and we're going to move through these six categories of retinal encoding to go from what works really well for categorical ordered data into what works well for nominal data. So one of the six categories that experts have agreed on on how we can make compelling visualizations is to vary the size of things in the visualization. So this one trick that we're going to be able to use is, and you've seen this all the time, bar charts do it, graphs, all sorts of things vary the size of the object for the visual encoding. The second bit is the saturation. So the deepness of the color can determine um, what the data point, what the underlying data represents. So we've got the size, we've got the color saturation, 
we also have orientation. So if you think about stock markets, stock markets always have these up and down arrows. There's a lot of ways we can use the organization of data using the orientation of our data points, especially with arrows. Fourth idea is the hue. So you'll see a lot of data visualizations make use of color. So we want to be able to tell our story with color. And the shape is the fifth element, and the very last element is the texture. So these are the six different types of retinal encoding that we can use to really encode data in a visual way. And we're going to use these to tell a story. So you now know everything you need to know on how to start thinking about making a simple visualization. So we've gone through the lecture part, and now we can actually start doing things and seeing things. So I have a one second challenge for you. So all of you hopefully will Watch up here, and I'm going to show you something for just one second, and then I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you guys what you saw. So are we ready? I promise there was only one second challenge. So what do you see? Can you? Yeah. What's your name? Jeff. Jeff saw. Categorical data. You saw categorical data over time. So you saw some time. So you can capture a lot. What is, is there any visual elements that people remember? What do you remember? Different colors. Okay, there's red. Where was the red? At the top. And so what does red generally represent? Hot or severity, right? And so there's some red line way at the top. You picked up that there, Jeff picked up there's date data. That was a great pickup. And we saw that, and in just a second, we were able to know where that red line was. It was at the top. It represented some kind of urgent data. And in fact, this is a visualization. Some of you may have seen this. is Bloomberg's news visualization for climate change that they map every single year for the past 100 years or so as bar charts through time. And they kind of show it in increasingly red the higher it gets. So as you're scrolling through a feed or a news feed or something like that, you instantaneously are able to see that there's, um, that there's something that captures your attention at the top. You're, you're immediately drawn to the top. And only once you've sort of looked at the visualization for a while do you even focus on this other data, all the other history data that they have in that visualization to kind of completely tell you the story. That it's not just the red line today that we're worried about. The red line matters because there's all of these other lines, all of these other data points underneath. So I think this is an example of visualization that really tells the story of what the data they're trying to share is. And it does it using something called pre-attentive features. And often in visualization, you have about 250 milliseconds to capture your user's attention if you're making a public visualization. So you have about a quarter of a second as they're scrolling through their Facebook feed, as they're scrolling through Twitter, You've got about a quarter of a second to really capture that, or they're going to move on to the next thing. And even in a work setting, when you're providing this visualization as like a uh, dashboard, if they, don't if they don't instantaneously see a value in it, they're going to just blow it off and get their data somewhere. So pre-attentive features are a way that we can begin to tell the story. Because if we don't capture our audience, if we don't instantaneously give them some value, then they're going to move on. So there's actually a lot of science behind pre-attentive features. And I'm going to see if we can actually prove the science right here in this room. So I am going to show you another um, challenge. So again, just one second. If you look at your phone, you're going to miss it. So, and then I'm going to ask what you saw. You saw squares. Okay, so we saw a grid of squares. There's two different colors. Two different colors. Oh, interesting. Okay, and one exception. One exception. Only one exception? Two. Two exceptions. <laughs> I was annoyed. Okay, two exceptions. And what were the exceptions? They were darker colors. In fact, they were red. And where were they? So one was just saying top left, top right, bottom, 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 bottom left, and middle right. right. So in just a quarter of a second, every one of you in this room was able to identify some really key elements 
about the visualization. So yeah, one was in the bottom left, and one was kind of in the center right, and we saw there were two of them, and in just a fraction of a second, second this, these pre-attended features capture and burn them into your mind so that you knew exactly that any of these features were there. So this is awesome. And there's a lot of science that says that this is something that every human's going to recognize. But color is not the only pre-attentive feature. So I've got a, I've got a second pre-attentive feature, another one second challenge. So here we go and... <laughs> and so somebody, I haven't picked on people in the back. So what do you see? You saw squares and a circle. Where was the circle? Two down, four Whoa, oh, we have a precise number I heard. <laughs> Second one down, four Second one down, four over. Right? Oh, oh so close. Three. Second down, three to the right. Yeah, so you can see that the form in an otherwise uniform field, if something has a different form, you are attuned to seeing that and remembering what the form is, as well as what the um, as well as where that is inside the visualization. So we have these two really powerful tools to do this form. So we're not even done yet. There's a third challenge. Ready? <laughs> uh, yeah, I got fancy. So what, what did we see? We saw animation. We saw movement is what we'll describe it as. Where was the movement? Bottom right. Second row from the bottom. Three in. Oh, this is a great group. Yeah, third, third row or third column from the right. Second one from the bottom. So yeah, we see that movement is something that allows us to capture our attention, again, with only a split second. This is actually one of the hardest ones to do because movement's going to be something that we're, that often we're dealing with static images if you're kind of on a Twitter feed or something. So movement's arguably the hardest feature to work on. And then the very last thing, the very last pre-attentive feature. Got, ready? So somebody who I have, so, you guys, how are you doing? What'd you see? A square was displaced. And where was it? Third, first row, third from the right. Awesome. Yeah, so the spatial positioning, in an otherwise uniform field, the spatial positioning is a pre-attentive feature. Your eyes, without even consciously knowing what's going on in the visualization, will attract yourself to that pre-attentive feature. So I want to put this together and see and use some of these pre-attentive features. So I actually need somebody's help. Do you, do you have a stop? Do you know how you stop watching your phone? I can try to figure it out. You can try it. Does I, someone, I, I, I watch. Is it down to the second? Uh, yeah. Okay. So if you want to, if you're okay timing us, I'm going to show off a slide and I want all of us to count the number of red boxes on this slide. And once we hear a couple people shout out the number, I'll tell you to, to stop and we'll see how long it was. So I'll say start if you can start the clock when I say start. Are you ready? All right, so count number red squares. Ready, set, go. 14, 14, 14, 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. All right, stop. 14. So how long did that take? About five, six seconds? Six seconds. Six seconds? Five to six seconds. So it took a little while. You guys are actually. I've given this presentation a few times before. This is the fastest group to have multiple people say the correct answer. So you guys are fantastic. Um, the usual time is close to 10 or 11 seconds. So you guys are stellar. Um, all right, so we'll do this one more time. If you can do the stopwatch one last time. And we're going to, again, the goal here is again count the number of red squares. Ready, set, I'll get out. People are, get out of your way. Here, I will make it completely out of the way so all of you have an unobstructed view. Ready, set, 14. So how long was that? Three, two to three seconds. 
three seconds. So what we saw is by using, so it's, you can't just throw pre-attended features in there, but if you use them sparks, if you use them sparingly, and use them in an otherwise uniform field, you can see that you can increase the time it takes a user, or decrease the time it takes a user to process the information. So both of these had 14 red squares. The fact that we organized the data, used color, used spatial positioning, allowed us as users, as readers of the visualization, to actually capture it even better. So we know about pre-attended features. We know about a lot of the features that can make a really compelling visualization. So what I want to do is actually take us through a data set and make a visualization that hasn't been created before today. So I actually spent a lot of time thinking about what the data set should be and talked to some of the members of this group as well as some of the um, a speaker who gave uh, Professor Neil Davis, a colleague in my department, talked to him about, he gave a speech on software carpentry, talked about kind of what the right audience is. And I think a data set that I chose to go with was a data set that I think it will appeal to some of you and it won't appeal to other of you, but I think it's a data set we all can understand. And we're going to look at the history of every Illini football game <laughs> from 1892 to 2018. So Illini football played back in the day when uh, they actually traveled by train to the games before the automobile. So this is quite a, the original games were very local, but this data set has about 1,238 rows. It's publicly available on my GitHub. And we have just organized structured data, very clean data. It's got the season, the date game was played, the location, whether or not it's home or away or at a neutral site. The opponent, the result of that game, the line A score, the opponent score, and any special notes about the game, like if it's a homecoming game or not. So this is a data set that is pretty boring that there's just a whole bunch of records of games that are played over years, and there's a bunch of stuff that, um, there's just a bunch of kind of statistical data about how these games are played. I want to know, what story do we want to tell? Because right now, Illini football is not doing so well. So we want to really tell a story that really celebrates something happy, because the story we want to share success. Do you have an idea? Well, it wasn't going to be happy, but uh, I work in admissions, and we know that there's some kind of correlation between if the team is winning and how many people apply. Oh, fascinating. So there's a core, what's your name? Thomas. Thomas said, there's a, he knows from admissions that there's a correlation between having a winning football team and the number of people who apply. So go Illini. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope we start winning. I hear basketball may be going good. Loyola, All right, so, so yeah, we, we know we want to be winning. Okay, so I like this idea that we want to highlight wins somehow, right? We want to focus on winning. I want to take that element. Any other thoughts on what we could analyze? Identify a period over time where there's a victory. Identify a period over time where there's a lot of winning. Okay. So is there something that we usually win um, a lot? Is there some factor that might might influence winning? Opponent. The coach might, might not, but... Opponent? Opponent, yeah, because there's some teams we just always seem to win against, which is nice. So what if we organize this data by the opponent we play? So here's us playing Indiana. And we actually, I, I know the back of the room is hard to see, but if you see the larger block here in this column, that's a win. The smaller kind of blob is a loss. Um, so... So we win against Indiana, and we have these things, so I think it would be actually really fascinating to actually highlight the fact that we can win consecutive games against the same team. <laughs> so we've got these like win streaks, and even when we're not doing so well, we actually still have win streaks against certain teams. So I think this could be an actual compelling thing to start to think about and to start to visualize. So the first thing we need to do is just take this data set and ask a data science question. For every game, how many previous consecutive years did the line win against that team? 
And the tool I use to answer this is the tool, my favorite tool in data science, which is Python. Okay. Some of you prefer R. Um, you could even do this, I would argue that this question is simple enough, you could do it in Excel. So I wrote some, um, so that basically we're going to look at data, I'm going to say, in 1987, um, the Illini played Indiana, so we're going to look back and continually look back each year until we find a loss. So here we were on a seven game winning streak coming into our game on November 7th, 1987. So I wrote some Python code to do exactly that. And now we have our data set augmented with one more column called the streak. And that is how many games we won previously up until that particular game. So here we're on a six game winning streak right here. And what we have is we now have a data set that tells enough information to start to really think about telling a story about that data set. To begin to think about, so we know the story, we want to focus on something positive, we want to focus on wins, we want to focus on, in fact, win streaks. So we've got eight different pieces of data, we <coughs> identify what kind of data they are, whether they're the quant data, categorical data, and just a simple exercise of kind of labeling the data. And then the question I have for you is, let's figure out what elements are important. So I'm going to argue the season that we play is important, because we want to show it data over time. So season is an important piece of data, and that is a categorical um, ordered data. So each season has a particular bucket. We bucket games into seasons based on the year they're played. So this is nice categorical ordered data. So in the, if we're really telling a story about how, data, how the line is playing, do we care about the actual precise date of the game? Is that a feature that we're that interested in showing? Do we care if it was a September game or an October game? Yeah. No. I would say for visualization that's really just focused on winning streaks, we don't really care if the game was played in September or November. All right, if we're just focused on a visualization that focuses on um, winning streaks, do we care where the physical location of the game was played in a high level visualization? Probably not, right? So I'm going to just focus on what's really, really neat, what's the most important factors. All right, uh, when we're focused on winning streaks, do we care about the opponent? Yeah, we definitely care about the opponent. Uh, do we care about the results of the game? We better care about the results of the game, because we're focused on the win streaks. Uh, do we care about what streak we're on? Yeah, that's the entire purpose of visualization, show off the win streak. Do we care about the actual Illini, given the fact we know we won, do we care about the score the Illini had? No, we just care that we won. We don't really care about the score. What about the opponent's score? We don't care about the Illini score. Certainly think we don't care about the opponent's score. And we, do we care about whether or not the game was a homecoming? So some of these may be co-founding variables, they may affect whether or not we won or not, but they are not interesting in our, in showing off a story about the line I made. So we have this idea and we kind of can boil it down to the four important factors about the visualization. And I pulled out a number of different um, categories that can be fit into here. So there's 127 years in our data set, there's about 100 different teams we've played. Um, there's three different types of result. There's win, lose, and tie. We have tied a few football games, which is something I learned. And um, then there is a streak on how many streaks does that category, how many streaks is that game a part of? Is it a one streak game, two streaks? So now we have to look and so now we have to think about how we're going to visualize this. And the first thing we might want to do is we are always usually going to focus on the bottom left quadrant first, the idea of the planar data. So the planar data is great for quant data, but we have none of that. Otherwise, it's great for high dimensional data or, um, or high, high number count data. So among these four rows, what are the two with the high, the two highest numbers? We have season and we have opponent. So, with the season and the opponent, we can use um, one to make an x-axis here, one to make a y-axis, and with a little bit of code, 
we have an x and y axis. So I, the tool that I use to do this is a tool called d3.js, which is a JavaScript tool. Um, it's really, really powerful. It allows you to control every aspect of the visualization. Um, but you can do something similar in other tools like um, GraphX and um, various different uh, tools that you can kind of more drag and, drag, uh, drag and drop tools. Um, so we have an X and Y visualization. And now we need to focus on, okay, we need now the retinal encoded data. So everything else we have to encode by color, shape, size. We know where the location is. We know every game has a season and an opponent. We need to decide what the um, encoding for everything else is. So let's think about encoding the result. So what, how, what retinal encoding can we use to encode the result? Of the six different things. Color. 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 Yeah, I think that's kind of obvious. That we often, often will associate one color with winning and one color with losing. So of these four, uh, or of these six ideas, I think using color, which we more um, academically say is the hue to differentiate from the saturation, the hue of the data point can represent a win or a loss. So we have a win or a loss, and we can put this into our visualization, a little more D3 code, and uh, that doesn't really capture any attention. It's dots. Whatever. Like, I mean, sure, it's data, but I don't think this really tells a story. But that's okay, because we're not done yet. So, the very last point is the streak. So, the streak is uh, definitely ordered data. So, what might be a good element to encode the streak data with? Sorry. Size, I agree. That sounds great. Why don't we make the size of the game based on the streak? So, small streak, very small dot. Large streak, very big dot. And a little more DS, uh, D3.js code. Oh. Okay. Wait, I think we can do another one second challenge. <laughs> so, what do you see? There's one really long streak, even from the very back. Okay, where were the streaks kind of located? <clears throat> kind of all over. We were kind of winning. And to kind of show it, there's definitely, like, even without kind of realizing what's going on, you have these pre attentive features that we've now included into this visualization to really highlight the fact that there are these streaks. And particularly Iowa. I don't know. Iowa had some rough years in the 50s and 60s. Well, we had a great team. In the 80s and 90s, look at that line. We were doing awesome. And I think this really, and lately, I think we're building up to streaks. In a couple of years, it's going to look great, I'm sure of it. But it really highlights the success, and it highlights these regions of saying, hey, this is awesome. And you know what's really awesome about this? You, every one of us in this room could have done this. This is something you could do. You've figured out every element of this. We just took the quadrant of data science success and sort of applied all of the different data categories and the data, uh, and rendered the data according to a few rules. And we came up with something that was quite compelling that really tells a little bit of a story that lets you focus on the win streaks and the thing that you're going to find that your eyes are going to draw to is probably going to be either that big streak in the middle where we beat Iowa for 10 years in a row, or 11 years in a row, I think, and the 1980s where we had this huge, several large streaks throughout. This also kind of tells another story of kind of the teams we play. So there's some teams we play consistently. So there's a lot of kind of different stories you can tell. And so I did a little bit of polish to this just so that um, it really looks nice. So I wanted to do as little as possible because I really wanted this example to be something you could look at and really see. So there's three things that it feels like kind of just minimal. So I added a legend on top of it all so that users could, if you weren't in this room, you could actually understand what's going on. Um, 
I added a mouse slash tap event, so you can tap any one of the circles and dive into the data. And I did a bunch of hacky stuff to make it work on mobile because mobile devices are hard. And um, what we have is we have a visualization that all of you can look at. So you are part of creating this visualization that if you go to wap.csilinois.edu slash dsug, data science user group, you can see this visualization, you can pull around with it, and um, all the source code is right there as well. So you can dive in and see the D3 code and see how this visualization was actually created and, and play around with it, and even take it and modify it with your own data. Because I think what's really important is for us to leave here being able to do something and being able to be excited about the data set and then dive in and actually visualize that data set. And that's hopefully a little bit about what you're going to be able to take away from today. So I'm going to, in the just for like five more minutes, and then I'll make sure we'll open up to questions, um, is just give a little brief update about the data science that's happening at the University of Illinois. Um, so there has been this real movement in Illinois to really think about the fact that basic computing today is required for almost every job. Let's face it, if you don't know Word, Excel, kind of your basic office tools, it's almost impossible to get a job. A lot of us at Illinois, including me, really feel that 21st century literacy may be data science literacy. That you absolutely need to do some analysis of data and be able to do that to have any sort of job. That it is going to be literacy like it is to know Word and Excel. I'm not sure what the tool is, I don't know the depth that you need to know, but I think in the future, if you can't analyze a few thousand rows of data, there's not much, you're going to find that there's um, not much value. So to do that, there is a course that we are now offering to anyone who's at Illinois. It's a freshman level. It satisfies the general education requirements for quantitative reasoning. And there's no prereqs. You can be completely phobic of math, and the class is welcoming to you. And it gives a broad introduction to data science by focusing on three aspects. It focuses on um, introductory statistics. So this is everything from experimental design to hypothesis testing and regression. It gives them a deep dive into the Python programming language with specifics on pandas as um, the kind of computational engine. They use Git, they use the command line, they use Jupyter, they use the tools that you really need to know to do data science. And then we really make a point to make sure we talk about privacy and ethics and the impact that, they, that data can have. Because as a data scientist, we really have a responsibility to make sure that the data that we're sharing is presented honestly and accurately. So, uh, so right now, um, I'm lucky you have a domain expert in statistics, uh, Professor Carly Flanagan, to teach it with me. So we have a statistician in the room and we have a computer scientist in the room kind of sharing both of our expertise, giving them different views of how data science is so important. So we're co-teaching this course this semester as well as future semesters. We're piling it right now with, 20, with students that comprise 20 different majors. So we have this extremely diverse group in there doing Python and data science for the first time. We're doing it with 600 students in the fall. So it's really getting that basic data science literacy to the students at Illinois and really being a leader in making sure that every graduate of Illinois has the ability to have a meaningful experience in data science. So with that, um, you can check out the visualization we created. You can find me on various social media platforms or email me at waf.illinois.edu. And I think we have about seven or eight minutes for questions. Yeah? Well, you, could you share some thoughts on how you think uh, local not-for-profits to develop data literacy? Yeah, so how, can, so how can we get more community development of data literacy? Is that sort of what you're thinking? Yes. I think that's fantastic, and I think that really like this group right here is really the focal point for that. Is that I am actually like I am like sort of fomoing, jealous of the fact that I wasn't like I didn't know about this group. Like there's awesome stuff going, like this um, the Salvation Army data set challenge, like that type of stuff. Like that is stuff that people are excited about, passionate about. And like I, I think it'd be awesome if there was a group of if there was an awesome analysis that was done. Like, what if there was like YouTube videos on how you actually did that? How can you how can you teach people if they're excited about the story, if they're excited about what you're doing with this data set? Can you give them ways to engage? Can you teach them the basic skills through that data set? And how does that look? And I don't think I have all the answers, but I think the fact that we have a room full of 100 people who are passionate about data science is the right place to start. How about submitting stuff to courses like 
107 data in projects. Yeah, I, I think, so Robert mentioned like, there's also the opportunity to sort of get more engagement with students and with the university. I think as we have more and more data scientists in training, we're gonna have more and more students who are eager to build up projects, just like what Matt said in the introduction. When I talk to students, I tell them, if you want a job, you better have a portfolio of projects ready to go to show off. I've had students who are interviewed will, will be like, oh, so you worked on this? Can you bring up your cell phone and show it to me? In the middle of an interview, and this is what modern interviews look like, that you talk about a project, they don't want to just hear about the project, they want to see the project. They want to see the data science that's going on. So these, like, the idea of being able to get that, the, the fact you were able to get the Salvation Army data set to be a public data set, it's fantastic. It's local data that has impact. And the story you can tell about that, like, I, dude, if I was interviewing someone and they were telling me about how they worked with Salvation Army data and made it, made a um, nonprofit more effective about their time and um, their, the givings that they were able to generate, I'd be like, this is awesome. I want to hire you. Any other questions? <clears throat> away. Yeah. I, uh, so I'm one of the grad students in the mechanical engineering department, uh, and I have a basic understanding of what, what the data science is about. Um, but we do a lot of human subject testing, and it involves a lot of data processing. What is a good way for non-data science majors or CS majors to get in? Involved and processing the data for their testing results. Yeah, yeah so the question is, what is Leo. Leo, Leo's big question is like, he, if you have a bunch of data, especially really messy data, like human subject data, where you've tagged it, or you've got timestamps, and you need to process it, what's, the, what's a good tool to process it? And I am a huge, huge fan of Python. The number of libraries in Python is enormous, and I think the language is really, really um, friendly to an office. So I, I think over a weekend you can learn the basics of a Python programming language. Then it's really um, kind of um, working up to kind of figure out how you need to use Python to clean up your particular data set. So I think there's no way of getting around doing some simple programming. But I think every single day we've got better and better tools. So there's a huge community around Python. People have really solidified along on the Python language to get things done. And I think that I would recommend taking taking a dive into the Python. You might, might want to do a software carpentry to like new software as well. Yeah, so Robert said there's software carpentry workshops. I think the one that Matt was talking about was R, which would also work, but I'm sort of biased towards Python. <laughs> um, certainly if you think more mathematical or if you've done a lot of mathematic foundations, R is a much more mathematical language, while Python's kind of more procedural language. So if you hate Python, you probably will love R. <laughs> so I hate R, so I love Python. <laughs> um, but I have colleagues of mine who love R, and they get awesome things done. So there's not, don't, don't be religious about your language. Use what you feel comfortable with. Yeah? Aren't Python can play together? Can, they... can R and Python play together? Yeah, I think they can. They, they can. Um, so I think that one thing, as I'm switching between languages, I'm often using CSV as an interview format. So you just sort of dump, uh, both Python <laughs> and R has a great way to just dump data out. Um, you can dump it as a CSV file in both languages really easily. If you have more structured data or more complex data, you can use like a JSON format or something. Um, but also now, I think in R, they are uh, released something that you can also do Python programming inside of R. Well, R Studio is allowing Python inside of it? I mean, yeah, yeah like the, you can start coding it. Wow. The polar vortex has reached R. <laughs> <laughs> Words I would. Uh, that's awesome. So if you chose Python, I think we're in a good camp. <laughs> because you certainly cannot do R in Python. <laughs> so. All right. Any? Yeah. Sorry. So it's just a follow-up. So I, I, I'm a more of a Python kind of guy. So I agree uh, with your, um, what do you call it, preference for Python. <laughs> um, but one of the question I have though, is like, uh, there are things that's hard for, I think, uh, me to like, uh, Understand uh, even with like Google searching and, and learning on my own, I've I've learned I self-taught myself. But 
if I had some like a mentor, like some like even another student or uh, grad student to help me out, like this is a better tool to use, or is this kind of idea? Like, is there a group that I can? Uh, is there a group to help you out doing data science? <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I, I, I think I see hundred people. So this is Leo. Um, you should meet Leo, especially if you're interested in cleaning up data in Python. <laughs> Hey, get chatting. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn this back over to Matt. Thank you again for the ability to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Point is followed. We're not going to do your homework for you. Okay, so we'll try that. Um, thank you all for coming out. We, we get together the first Friday at noon right here every month. We'll be back on March 1st. We're always looking for speakers. We're always looking for uh, more of these community impact projects. So if you have anything, you can come talk to me or message me on the meetup. Thanks a lot for coming out.